Hello, hello, my great role-playing tribe. Welcome to another chapter of El Sotano del Brujo. Today, I'm going to make a small video answering some of the questions uh, that one of my subscribers posted on one of my Spanish-speaking uh, videos. And he asked me like a series of questions, especially because he is completely new to the game. And I said, hmm. That's that's kind of fun, you know. You know, I can I can grab his questions and then make like a video answering them, and why not? Why not make it in English as well? Because you know, who knows? Perhaps some of you are already starting in the game and have perhaps the same questions, and uh, I decided to do that here. So let's go to the chase, okay? Uh, let's go and begin trying to answer these questions, okay? Uh, the first question that Nacho. He's one of my subscribers. Uh, he asked me, was, you know, how do I handle damage? You know, um, when I play level zero funnels, uh, I'm the kind of guy that really enjoys playing with the theater of the mind. You know, uh, I can I do not like much using minis. You know, I, I have nothing against minis or combat maps or 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 special or special miniatures and dungeon tiles. I have nothing against it at all. You know, I was the kind of guy that played uh, uh, Dungeons & Dragons 3.5 for years. And, you know, I had like these huge maps, these huge battle maps in my old basement. And I had like a lot of minis and tokens. And, and I even had these special rulers that had like a special cut so that you had like a special grids for for wizard fireballs and area of effect spells, you know? It's, it was fun, but it ended up being mostly like, a bit like Warhammer instead of Dungeons and Dragons. And I think that's my only gripe with it, with this particular way of playing, which is with maps and minis. And, um, and this, uh, and I'm telling you this because it is related to the question. Uh, when I play level zero funnels, I just enjoy using the theater of the mind, you know? And this goes with my philosophy of how to play DCC, okay? This is, of course, my personal philosophy. You are welcome to use all the maps that you want, all the minis that you want, all the battle maps and grids and templates, anything that you want. It's your game, after all. But for me, and especially because uh, if you have been following my videos, you will see that I am a bit obsessive with time management especially because I play on, on public venues. And usually when I'm doing my world tours, I, I try to stick to uh, no longer than four hours time slot. So for me, time, man time management is a must. It's for me like one of the number one uh, things I try to uh, prioritize, okay? Because it, it keeps things uh, flowing smoothly in, and helps me not wander off during play. And especially with new people, I believe that it's very important for people completely new to the game, which has been my experience here in Panama, uh, you really need to keep their attention. And sometimes people think that there is going to be like, I don't know, like a tabletop game, and, and they're going to spend, I don't know, one hour, two hours, but you, you will know, I think you should know that role-playing game sessions can usually last longer than four hours. So for me, four hours is like the, the top for me, uh, for running a model. And I have managed to make uh, most sessions in the, within the three hours to three and a half hour sessions. I, have ma I make them only that long, which is for me like something I believe is the perfect time for somebody that is just trying out the game for the first time. So the question that Nacho was, was asking me since he's completely new and he usually expands himself when he's playing, he, he says, how do I handle damage? Specifically, how do I handle damage during funnels, especially if I'm not using minis, I'm not using any kind of maps. So I'm just using theater of the mind and I'm practically keeping more of the calculations in my head and, uh, and writing some special things in, in, a, in, a, in a regular paper sheet. So what, I'm, uh, what I told him and what I'm telling you now is that for me, uh, in level zero combat, what I really like to do is used like uh, these very simple mass combat rules. And for example, you have on one side, you have the players, the level zero players, and you usually have a mob. 
you know, you usually have, if, if it's about four characters or three characters per side, per, per, uh, per player, you usually end up with about 16 to 24 people on one side, okay? And of course, as a judge, as a DCC judge, your first job is to thin that herd, okay? You have to thin that herd. And because, you know, it's DCC. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's part of the appeal for me. For me, it's part of the appeal of DCC. You know, it's hey, having to stand, you know, you, you know, that you should know that I use like this WeWorks, uh, the cause of this uh, rubber stamp. It's on the Goodman game site. And I, I actually love that sound, you know? So for me, I have to kill people. You know, not because I really want to, but I actually, uh, I have to do it with the monsters and basing myself on the, on the, on the die rolls, but I actually enjoy it, especially at the, at the beginning, because when people begin to see that the characters are beginning to die, they begin to wise up and then they begin to act much better and more cautiously. And then that's, that's how you make new people begin to like uh, get more into the mood. So for me, killing people, especially during the first combat, uh, it's, it's something like a skill that you have to develop because when people are completely new and then they begin to see the slaughter, they get, oh my God, I can run out of characters. Of course, I usually tell them that I can't replenish their characters, but they usually get kind of possessive with the, with the remaining character, the remaining level zero characters, okay? So, um, so how do I handle damage? So you have on this side the players, the little zero guys that are completely like peasants, I, I don't know, they are completely random people. And they have absolutely, they usually do not have very good stats. Uh, and they usually, their damage output is very poor. And of course, this is something that I have to remind usually some of the judges here. So perhaps this can work for you as well. You have to remember that in DCC, the mobs usually do not have that many hit points, okay? I, I don't know why, but I, I think it's be perhaps because of, of people coming from other role-playing systems, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, or, I don't know, because they usually tend to, tend to assume that mobs or monsters uh, will have, a, I don't know, like 10 hit points, 20 hit points, 30 hit points, which is completely ridiculous for TCC, okay? Especially at level zero. And uh, and so what I do, especially because, again, I'm not using the kind of, of supplements, I'm not using minis, I'm not using, a, uh, I'm not using even a map, okay? I just, I'm just winding it up, I'm just doing it with, the, with my mind. So what I do is that, for example, if the, I, I, we have, I don't know, like 10 level zero guys here, 10, 12, it doesn't matter. And you have like a fixed counter because that's why I love using modules, official modules, because they have like a usually pretty balanced number of monsters, about six to 10 monsters, which are completely jar trash, but they usually work well in thinning the herd of, of level zero characters. And you have to remember that these guys, these monsters usually do not have more than what? Two to three hit points? So they can usually die with a solid hit of even a guy wielding a, a dagger, okay? Especially when you begin to realize that when uh, one of the powers of, of mob combat, because there's a mob on this side and, and another on this side, is, is that they usually, what, people wise up and tend to gang up on other monsters, okay? So, uh, so if you had to, if you remember that these monsters usually do not have that many hit points, let's say that there are 10 beastmen, and these 10 beastmen guys have only like, what, three hit points each. So what I do is that I visualize like a pool, like a pool of hit points, okay? So if there's only 10 guys, 10 bad guys, and they each have three points, and then there's a total of 30 hit points that you can uh, like group up in a pool in the cloud, using your mind okay so I have three hit points here that these guys this, mod, this particular mob has to whittle down so every time these these uh, the players every begin attacking and I usually tell them okay you have like two guys here you have two guys there you know description the, the description of the battle usually is I try to make it as fluid as possible I try to describe like okay there's like um, I don't know like two guys here there's three five three or five guys on this side some of them are having this you know I try to describe it and then my players begin to say okay I want to go and charge okay 
I let them do everything they want. It's it's their it's the player characters. They are allowed to do everything they want. What I usually do is that when I begin attacking, and then I begin receiving damage, is that I tally up all of the total damage of every player. For example, and I don't know if you have seen my other videos, but I like I really like. For example, if somebody has uh, four level zero characters. I make them roll at the same time four level uh, four d20s. Okay, why? Because this saves time. Uh, for me, it's essential, and uh, it's also a bit, a bit um, for me. It's a bit slow when somebody has like four characters and then they get, they get one. Okay, it's a miss. I mean, and it's also level zero combat. It's going to be a lot of misses. Okay. And then another, and then another. No? So I think no, it's, it's okay. I I usually tell my players it's okay. Just grab. I usually do. I do this uh, for my for my mo for my monsters as well. I just grab a, like a bunch of dice, okay, and then just I just roll them. It's easier. It's faster. So my players begin uh, making damage to this uh, to this mob of monsters. And they usually do, like, usually per round, they usually do like, I don't know, like 7 to 12 points of damage, and that's being generous. Because at level 0, you know, the damage output of the player character is pretty, it's pretty low. So what I do is, if they do, I don't know, 7 points of damage, and I have like this for me, this particular pool of hit points, that they are whittling down, that they are, they are completely uh, carving up and, and destroying slowly. Uh, I don't know, 30, 30, 30 hit points minus 7, it's, uh, it's I, I suck at math, okay, uh, it's uh, 20, okay, 23, it's 23 points of damage, uh, it's 23 hit points left of damage, so there's like 7 points of damage, then I grab, I say, okay, two guys died, see, because each of these guys has only 3 hit points, so I just... And I said, oh my God, we, in, in, this, in this particular round, when it ends, I said, okay, due to your damage and all, all the things that you have done, okay, you have, uh, you have managed to, to kill or incapacitate two of the bad guys, okay? And then, and the extra damage, I just put it aside. I hope you're following me. I put this extra damage aside, for example. And then the round begins again, my monsters make damage, then my players get damage, and then they do this time, I don't know, they make eight points of damage. So, okay, I know that from the T23, I'm going to, to subtract eight points, and every three points, okay, that's why I, keep, I kept that, uh, that extra point of damage from the previous round in a special side. Every three points of damage, another guy dies, okay? That usually how it works. It's a bit mechanic, it's extremely simple, I just use this particular pool of, of, of total hit points and guys begin to die the, from, from, the, from the bad guys, okay? At the, just, just to make it clear. And my players usually are pretty happy with that. And what happens if one of them, okay, no, I want to, uh, we, every, all of us want to attack that particular guy, okay? I say, okay, go attack it. Go attack that particular guy, okay? And usually, if there's a left, if everybody attacks the same guy, and there's leftover damage because that guy I don't know had like three hit points, four hit points, and they did I don't know ten points of damage, I usually say okay during the skirmish you actually uh, you actually manage to kill another guy. It doesn't matter, and why? Because for me, uh, advancing the adventure is one of the key aspects of it. Okay, I know that some of you might be a bit obsessive might get obsessed with the fact that I perhaps did an extra damage to the mobs or I'm helping them. Trust me, I'm not helping them. Uh, but for me, you have to realize that for me, encounters are usually not the most fun part. For me, it's like how the characters react to these encounters, these particular combat encounters. For me, is how they begin to explore. So for me, combat has never been like the main issue here. So I try to make it extremely simple, okay? So it has worked wonders. I actually kill a lot of them and when, I, when I roll back. So it's, it, 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 it even has, it, it's completely, I, I never favor them either. I only let their own roles decide their own fate. So for combat, especially with mass combat, we have like a, a bunch of, of, of 
completely trashy mobs that are that only have one hit point, two hit points, or three hit points. If they die in droves, that's that's absolutely completely normal for me. So I do not fret that much with this. So I do not fret that much with damage allotment. Okay. I try to I, I try to use this particular method of having like a, this big pool of, of damage, this big pool of uh, hit points, and then one subtracts from the other, and that's it. And that's it. And then I begin to narrate how it flows within the within the combat. And I learned this. Um, I learned to do this. Uh, I think that was one of my um, my first insights into how to handle damage in combat. Uh, because if you do it mechanically, it's going to be like these guys have to hit this other guy, and then and then you have to to like maximize efficiency. So you have one guy hitting this guy, one group hitting this other. Okay? That's that's thinking like with a combat grid. When I'm doing a theater of the mind thing, I have, for example, I remember uh, something that I learned when I was younger. I was um, in a small like uh, role playing convention in my hometown, and there were uh, there, there was this particular guy that I remember was playing second edition, and uh, it was a high level campaign. Uh, the the guys had like I don't know like 60, 70 hit points. And I remember uh, a particular scene that always struck me as very noteworthy. And this is, I'm going to explain why I, I handle damage this way and why I kill sometimes uh, some of the monsters in a certain way. Is because in this particular session back in the day, I remember I, I, was, I, was, I was a spectator. I remember uh, there were like uh, three guys that all of them were fighters and then there was a cleric and they were attacking and it was like in the crusades type of thing. And I remember that this dungeon master said, okay, one of you guys is hit with an arrow in the leg. And okay, you get, you got, uh, you got like seven hit points of damage. I said, oh, it's okay. I have like 80. No, it does, it's not okay. The dungeon master said to this particular player character. It's not okay because the arrow is in your leg. You cannot move very well. And he was like, what? Yeah, you cannot move very well. So you have your uh, movement rate half and you fight with a, with a minus one penalty. And the guy was, but, but I have 80 hit points. It's an arrow. I, I completely bounce on no? It doesn't matter how many hit points you have. <laughs> and, you know, it can, seem, it, can, it can seem like a bit arbitrary, but, you know, that... That particular moment when I was younger and I saw this guy doing that, uh, you know, it opened up my mind. And I said, oh, well, yes. It doesn't matter how many hit points you have. You know, uh, you have to keep going with the narrative. Okay? And, of course, this guy, he had, like, a, a, an old second edition a fighter, a high-level fighter. And he had, like, I don't know, 80, 90 hit points. But a single arrow completely um, a, almost incapacitates him. And that's when I realized that usually do not have, I mean, I mean for me, for me it's more, it's more fun, usually have to make the narrative go, the narrative keep flowing. And that particular moment for me was very enlightening because I realized um, that, you know, sometimes monsters do not have to play by the rules. And, and you know, it was extremely fun for me when I was watching, when I was uh, reading the core manual. And... They actually had the same approach to monsters. You know, monsters don't have to play by the rules. They can have all the weird abilities they can have. They can die as easily as you want them to be. You can make them hit as hard as you want them to be. As long as you keep it fair in a certain say, in a certain way for the players, okay? And when I mean fair, it's not like damage output has to be the same and hit point allocation has to be the same. Fair in a sense that they can keep, that they can feel they're doing they are making an actual change in the world around them, okay? So if I'm, so if I uh, make all monsters ha uh, have like a total, uh, have life subtracted from a total pool of hit, of hit points, it is not going to make a difference. The adventure is going to keep flowing, okay? And, you know, it's... It has always been like that for me. Uh, you know, um, 
if some of you have played, I don't know, Pathfinder Pat, Pat or, uh, Dun- or the old classic Dungeons and Dragons, uh, especially 3 or 3.0 or 3.5, I think you might be used to um, having monsters with very specific uh, stat blocks, with very specific uh, fortitude and reflex and uh, will saves and and you can actually do the math and, and if they have I don't know uh, they have eighteen points of dexterity you you already going to know how much uh, how much is the bonus and you can see that their baseline fortitude reflex and will saves are going to match with uh with the warrior progression or with, you know you can actually deconstruct a monster in certain systems, especially especially in uh, Pathfinder and uh, and in Dungeons and Dragons, but you see that does not apply here. Okay, because I know that some of you might say, "Oh my God, but that system kind of sucks." And what you what you mean by by having like monsters have like a total pool of hit points, and then all the damage that the players do is, is subtracted from this pool, and then you just make it sprinkle on the monster here, and then they begin to die. Uh, um, okay, but, but they I know it's, it, but, but, you no, know, I. Uh, this is important for me. They do not die like you hit here, and then uh, some random guy on the back dies. No, 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 no. You know, I, I try to make it like the 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 guy in front was the one that died because he was the one that got the damage. Okay, uh, I I try to 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 allo- uh, to allocate all of the damage in a way that within the theater of the mind works, and is believable. And and remember that. Uh, I have seen also that some people usually are like, uh, are like very uh, close to how the rules work and if, if something goes beyond the rules it doesn't work anymore and it's broken or or they feel that it's not correct and and for me that's kind of limiting yourself because you're always going to be revolving around the rules when the rules should be revolving around you and this is why this particular question uh, I decided to make uh, these questions like a small video because I wanted to explain it to you I wanted to, 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 to know in case you don't know, because I have seen people, I have had experiences, for example, when I, back in the day, when I was a dungeon master in my city, Maracaibo, I remember uh, a story about this guy that was playing a Dungeons and Dragons 3.5, and uh, he, land, he, he, he managed to get a dragon into a, into a fight with his players. And you know it's it's Dungeons and Dragons. You know players practically kill the kill the dragon in three in three turns in three combat rounds. And the dungeon master was, why why did my dragon die so fast? You know because mechanically, the dragon had to die mechanically according to the rules because you know he got some crits and some of the guys uh, were uh, were able to hit very hard and it was within their level range. And, and and this guy was like completely bummed out that his dragon died. I mean, a dragon that he, oh my God, I'm going to use this particular dragon. Yes, he has to. And then he died in about three or four rounds. And he was, oh my God, it's a dragon. Why did he die? Why did he die like a, like a, <laughs> like a goblin? You know, he died like in three rounds. Why is that? This sucks. So he, he came to me and he said, bro, why... Why do dragons last for almost all of the rounds? For like 10 rounds and, and he, they practically wipe or party. But then I grab a dragon from the monster's manual and he was beaten like three turns and the three combat rounds, why is that? And then I grab him, I grab this guy and say to him, you know, I'm going to give you a secret. I'm going to give you one of the most amazing secrets that dungeon masters have a special power i'm going to give it i'm going to bestow it to you okay and this power is the power that i'm going to give to you you know the part that says hit points you know so that dragon how many hit points it had it had like 70 hit points just a number. okay you know what you can erase that number and make that dragon have 700 hit points if you want or 100 hit points or one hit point. Okay, you can use it mechanically the same with the hit point area. You can make it bigger or smaller or larger or whatever you want. And then the look on the face on this guy, he was like, well, 
and then you can you and you know that's that that's that was a magical moment because you know you know all I'm all about magical moments completely all about magical moments you know and when I play when I open up the mind of somebody and when it is just an Anubi dungeon master that they can do anything they want with their monster and then he was like ah and he was oh my god yes well, that means that your monsters do not have the, the standard hit points. I said, no. Usually they do not have them. They usually die when I want them to die. But, and, and then he, he asked me, but, but, but when we kill him, it actually felt that we actually kill him. Yes, that's you. That's me portraying a certain way and you, and you taking it in the way I want you to take it. That's what a, that's what a dungeon master has to do. He has to make the game enjoyable for you. But if you begin to stick into the rules, especially in a blindsided way, uh, it can be as fun, yes. I'm not saying it's bad, okay? Hey, I have to take this, uh, please uh, be right with me. You know, I'm not saying this, that is bad. I'm not saying that when you play strictly by the book or by the rules, it's going to be bad, no. But you do not have to be tied to these rules. And so that's how I handle damage. And that's how I handled dragons back in the day. You know, you can, and, and, and it is even here in the, in the core manual, you know. The monsters do not play by the rules. They do not have to. They die when they have to die. And when is going to be that moment? When you as a judge decides. That's, it's the time for them to die. Okay? So, if I have, again, if I have like a hit point pool, okay, and I subtract from it, and then I begin to, to randomly or, or specifically make certain guys die, it's okay. That's how I handle damage. Of course, you can if you play with a mad or you play with a theater of the mind version that is completely tactical and you want to specifically kill the, this guy because that's the guy that got all the, all the damage. Hey, good for you, man. But for me, I, I actually enjoy that freedom, that particular freedom, especially when assigning damage. And, and killing and killing bosses, especially bosses, when they have to die. For example, um, for me, okay? And so far for me, all of these years, it has worked extremely well. I, like, I, like I always tell everybody, if I see that my players are having fun, they're sweating a bit, or they are completely nervous that they're about to die, I know I'm making it real for them. You know, and the rules are like, I don't know, like a background to rely yourself, to, to rely someone, to, 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 to have like a basement, like a, like a foundation for you. And, um, but that's all. That's all. Just, so monsters are there to die. That's practically their only uh, reason of existence. They are there to die, and they are there to give player characters their loot. You know, that's the true spirit of Dungeon Crawl Classics. One of the parts of the most of the spirit of Dungeon Crawl Classics. Monsters are there only to die. Okay? Of course, they can have extremely complex plot lines if you want to. You can make the big, bad, evil guy of the campaign like it's as complex as you want to. But he will die when he has to die. And even within this, the frame, the, 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 the rules, you can twist it a bit always. Remember that there are certain uh, judges that prefer like a more literal approach to the rule set and that's good, that's fine. But for me, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of guy that actually bends, twists and sometimes completely breaks the rules just to make the narrative interesting to my players. And that's how I handle damage, okay? So that's the first question. Okay, let's go to the second question. Okay, the second question that Nacho was asking me is um, how do you usually, um, how do I handle uh, explaining magic? Uh, well, his question in Spanish was mostly how, how, uh, how I narrate magic, especially when the spells in DCC are a bit complex, you know? Um, complex, not in that they're, ex they're complex per se, I, I think that's the wrong word, they're a bit like long, because they have like this big table, and for newcomers, it can be like a bit daunting to to see like I don't know magic missile is just not like a one dice four of damage and, and an extra die four every few levels. That 
Magic Missile, for example, can be completely random, even from level one. And well, to usually get a bit confused about it. And he was asking me, uh, what did I think, or how did, how was I able to handle uh, narrating this particular uh, magic uh, or magic skills during play? And how I answer him in Spanish, and how I'm going to answer him to you in English, is that um, again, if you have seen my videos, you will realize that I'm the kind of guy that is completely obsessed with time management. And one of the keys to time management in a table, in a gaming table, is having information extremely readily available to players. And how do I do that easily? You know, I completely love this thing. I love this, uh, I love the core book because it's the only book you will ever need. But I also enjoy making a printout of spells, having a completely separate booklet or folder with the spells and give them to the players. Okay, so how do I handle a spell that I do not know anything about or that I do not know much? Well, easily. I do not have to do anything. The player already has a table there that explains how the, how the spell is going to work. He can even read the result when he rolls the d20. And that's it. So I can add to it like a mercurial magic effect, you know? Some people use it. Some people do not use mercurial magic. Um, I'm a bit 50-50 Mercurial Magic. I do not use it for world, for world tours because, again, uh, it's a bit of a time constraint for me and explaining to newbie players that every time they cast Magic Missile that it, it, might, rain, it might rain frogs, especially if that's the, that's the way they're going to cast Magic Missile. So I decided to make it Magic a bit more simpler for them because they usually are one-shots. I might be missing some of the magic of having a special guest, but Remember, I'm, I'm a bit tight on, uh, on, on time, but I do love uh, Mercurial Magic Effects. And sometimes I make, uh, if I have a, an enemy spellcaster, I usually assign Mercurial Magic to them to make things more interesting. And again, how do I narrate or how do I handle magic or people, how, how do I handle it? Well, easily, I, again, I have, I have made sure that everybody that is able to cast a spell has a copy of the spell readily available to him. I don't know if you have seen, but I have made like a, a, a Grimor of Chaos and a Project Book of Chaos, in which are like folders that I created just to have the printouts, okay? You can see it here in my videos. But the main reason I made them was to have uh, information readily available to my players. And this works out well for Warriors, you know? You have the, the small booklet, the DCC reference sheet, uh, it has like all the things that a, that a warrior can do and it, it, you know, the more prepared that you are, the better the game is going to flow and the better you can narrate any kind of spell. So he, he, and if a guy tries to launch magic missile, he already has the copy in my games. Oh, 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 uh, I know that some of you do not like making printouts, some of you might even enjoy looking around this this wonderful book, which I love, but it's a bit heavy. And usually when you are trying to, you know, it's much easier to just do a printout of the things that you know that everybody will need. So if somebody has a wizard, then you make a printout of the spells for wizard and make, if you want, which is also very helpful, make a printout of all wizard uh, class abilities. It helps, it really helps. It really helps with the flow. So this is like a, a question that I um, I enjoy because it also lets me tell you that the more information your players have, the better the game, for me, it has been my experience, uh, the better the game will flow. And usually, um, this works out well for clerics, for warriors, for thieves, especially because you, you know that the, um, that the, um, that the, thieb, uh, the thieves uh, skill table is completely different if the, if the guy is chaotic or neutral, so, you know, having like a table completely uh, printed, printed out and given to him, and you also have a copy, it works. Because you know, you know what, what bores me sometimes? It's like, okay, just let me see, let me see. Ah, okay, no, no, it's level one. Okay. You know, I hate that. I hate it, I hate it. Personally, I hate it. You know, I love the book, but I usually make copy, copies and, and and, and printed and printed on, on, on my house all of the tables that I know I'm going to need during the play. 
That's why I also like the, um, the quick rule set, the small, the small booklet, because it also contains everything in a very small way. But, you know, I, I really hate having to, you know, to talk around this book on the table, especially because uh, also in the, um, in the small store that I usually uh, go and play, uh, the tables are a bit small because they're mostly aimed to Magic the Gathering play, so you know that they are kind of they're kind of narrow. So you do not have much space. That's why I love level zero character sheets. They're, they're very small. Uh, that's why I also love uh, small printouts and small folders so that people can have them on their lap or on the side of the table and, and it does not take that much space, okay? And I'm going to be honest, uh, the more stuff that you have at hand and to get to the players will make, uh, for me, has been, again, it has been my experience, your experience can be completely different. <clears throat> it has made uh, the game run more smoothly for me and for and for my players, especially because they're completely, uh, usually I play with completely new people. Uh, when I mean new people, when I mean, I mean people completely new to the game, even to role playing. Some of them have, might have played Dungeons and Dragons and, and for me I try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, so that's how I handle spells for example and that's how I answer this this subscriber match okay so that's the end of question number two and the final question um, he asked me something <clears throat> he asked me something very uh, very interesting he, he asked me how uh, because he's completely new to the game and he doesn't he has a lot of questions and he was asking me uh, uh, bro how do you handle uh, people that have more than one character because you know that in funnels people usually have like four characters three or four characters uh, I have I have sometimes run a small smaller adventures with only two people and they usually have like eight characters each and I, I once ran a one-on-one -on -one, uh, model and this 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 play this single player he wanted to play and there was no one else around, so I played with him, like, I gave him, like, I don't know, like, 16 characters. And it actually worked quite well. There were only two guys surviving at the end, though. so it was, it was a win-win for, for him and for me. And um, so uh, the question that Nacho had was, uh, how do, I, uh, do people handle all of these characters? And again, this is because uh, people are mostly used to role-playing games. Uh, where the where players only handle one particular character, so they usually it's more easier to keep track of and stuff. So I began to tell him in my Spanish video that, well, there's really no particular answer to this question because every single player that I have met have their own play style, and they they handle their little mob of people, of characters, of level zero characters, in an extremely and completely different way to each other. So I believe that he was asking me this to try to, to compare or how to handle this with, and to, or to tell their players, his players, to tell his players how to, how to handle all of this. But then I told him to relax because everybody uh, handles their level uh, zero characters in a completely different way. No? So what I did was I began to tell him uh, to show him how different uh, players uh, handle their level zero characters. No, for example, you know, there's there was this particular guy, Victor, and uh, he he had like this funny this funny way of handling uh, his little mob characters. You know, he always told me that he never wanted to name his level zero characters until they survive the funnel. I say, well, what why is that? And then he began to tell me about a story that completely um, captivated him. Uh, he was he he was on a trip once to the United States, and he said that he was in a town. Um, I don't know where. I don't remember where. I think it was Savannah. Uh, that there was a story that uh, there was like a plague, or there was bad water, or, or the point is that uh, newborns uh, died uh, very very quickly. You know, hardly any newborn lasted their, their, their year, okay? It lasted a year or so. People stopped naming them, okay? That's, that's the story he was telling me. Some of you from the United States might, uh, might uh, enlighten me on this story. 
So this actually had a shock on him. So, so when he heard this story that people were not naming their newborns until they were at least one year old, and he said that he believes that with level zero characters, he had to do the same. Me being me, I said, oh, okay, man, sure. I had, I had completely zero issues with that. Okay, so so how can I um, address these guys? Okay, it's okay. Well, look, this guy is a jester, so you exist, he's the jester. And this guy is a bad, this guy is a, is a, is a gun farmer, and this guy is a noble, and this guy is an elf. Okay, elf, gun farmer, noble, and jester. Okay, that's how I'm going to address them, yes. So what he did was that during play, he referred to these characters only with vital profession, and he usually uh, tried to, to speak as the particular guy using his own voice, you know? And, and this is something I want to talk to you uh, about, because I know that certain judges actually uh, try to elicit like a role-playing response from their players. We usually feel that uh, their players are failing if they are not exactly role-playing as their characters. And uh, I believe that this question had something about it. Um, and I'm going to tell you the same that I told Ma, that I told Nacho. And it was that, you know, personally, I try not to coerce my, my players to act in a certain way. What I usually do so is taking a different approach to try to make them role play because, you know, there are, there are as many player types as there are people. So some people usually uh, are usually shy or if they are not shy, they usually do not like to talk much. And they might be silent types and that's okay. You can some you might not see it, but some of them are actually having even more fun than the guys that are completely laughing out and jumping around the table and, and screaming. I mean, it's it it's people, you know, you cannot you know, I'm a psychologist. You you it's very hard to try to to make people's behaviors fit like a certain criteria. We usually try to do that. There are several books about it that tries to narrow certain behavioral patterns and say that this person is did it. But you know, in role playing, I don't know, people enjoy it because this is, is since role playing, especially these type of games are so abstract that, you know, the pleasures are sometimes also abstract in a certain way. So how people handle their characters, and, and I'm talking to you about this, is because sometimes judges try to Try to elicit specific responses from their players, and if they do not, if they and if their players are not role playing, they they believe they're doing something bad, or or if they are um, extremely quiet, they think that this guy is is, is having a bad time, and, and sometimes that's not the case. So what I'm, I'm gonna try to tell you here is that sometimes you have to let people be during play, and especially when you're playing completely new people, you know. I, I have met a lot of role players and they are they're amazing. And but usually the core of the people that I have met, they rarely role play. They usually like to roll the dice and have fun and oh my god and react to the situation as themselves. It's very rare for me to see somebody um I, you know it should be different, I know, but some but it is very rare for me to see somebody actually going in, in character. You know, uh, and when I see that, uh, you know, it's like, you know, a, a, a light bulb, bling, I, I, I get like, oh my God, this guy likes to role play. I try not to force it. You know, I'm the kind of, of, of judge that, that enjoys letting people be because I actually enjoy them having fun and they're having fun that way. I'm not going to try to, to change it so that they can feel like a version that I have in my head of how they should play. Okay, I, I, I don't think that's right. If you think that's right, hey, that's that's hey, that's good for you, man. But um, uh, I really enjoy letting people be, especially during plays, because um, you will see that 
some of the people that have a lot of more fun are the ones that actually begin to play in character and these during funnels because those are the guys that I usually have, have reached the end of the module, you know? Because uh, and this is one of the, also one of the magic moments in, in, in DCC when you have like a completely random set of characters and, and, and a few of them make it to the end because those are the survivors. And then this, this is the guy that they, they begin to like try to accommodate themselves to the character that they already have and then sometimes try to be in character with that guy, okay? And, and that's the moment when I, uh, like I said you know, on my first question, I usually try to kill some of them uh, quickly so that they can begin seeing how deadly the game is, so that they, that they, they kind of wake up and wise up to, to the game. And usually when it's the middle adventure to the late adventure, I usually try to begin making emphasis on the survivors and some of the, um, you, you know, how I have this little technique, which is that, um, that I try to, um, to shine light on some of the moments within the adventure where that survivor had like a particular epic moment. It might not have not been epic, but for me, I try to portray it as epic. Oh my God, he survived! Oh, oh my God, how, how did he? How did he survive that that uh, that role, that saving throw? It's amazing. So, I don't know if I'm if I am portraying this right in English, uh, but I usually try uh, during play. Um, I, I have like certain key points and certain key moments that. Uh, I, I try to make um, players get more in tune with their characters. Usually it's at the beginning when I begin to kill some of them. You, uh, and it's not that big of an effort and I'm not exactly trying to kill them, but it's DCC, so a lot of them are going to die at the first. But I usually try to make the, the, those first deaths as gruesome as possible, as vivid as possible. And then when the survivors are in the, within the middle of the funnel and then actually near the end, uh, I try to... to, to to shine a light on some of the qualities they might not exist there you know this is something that you're going to get as a judge but you know this, is, this should be like more like another video but it's something to, to tell you more like an answer to this particular third question how people handle their characters and usually you as a judge if you want to coerce players or try to direct them to try to be more in tune with their characters to try to make them role play you know there are certain ways you can, without, without you f forcing players directly, you can make the character more appealing to the player, the character that has survived by making a lucky saving throw, by making a snarky comment, or by making an action, and then you painting it like, like something funny. And, and then this particular level zero character begins to gain life within the mind of the player. And that's how you get, it, you get this player more attached to it. And then he tries to, usually, they try to get more in tune and then try to be in character with this survivor, with this level zero. But, you know, this is something a bit more complex, but I'm making and giving you like, like a very brief version of what I do within play. Um, because it is important for me, for players to have fun always, so I try not to touch them much. I try to make them explore the game as they go. But, and, and then I just add like a little bit of attention to certain details to the players. And for example, um, something that you can understand if I'm being a bit too abstract, uh, just please remember that English is not my main language and sometimes certain concepts are perhaps a bit harder for me to describe, which I think in Spanish. Um, there was this guy that by, by sheer luck, uh, he, he got, a, you know, when I, go to the store i usually have like a this kind of stack of level zero characters which i print of uh, purple sorcerer games oh my god i love that side by the way actually do a printout of level zero completely randomized level zero characters and then i print them there are four per page and just i just cut them and then i begin to stack them and usually when I'm at the store and players sit around me, I just grab that stack and then I kind of shuffle it like it was like a, a deck of cards. Okay, um, and then I begin to, to deal it to them. I keep, usually I usually give players like four players, four level zero characters. And this guy, this particular guy, uh, he do, do the sheer luck chance or perhaps the... the, the or perhaps the pages were a bit too sticky. He got like three dwarves, three completely separate dwarves with completely different professions, but he had he got on his first hand three dwarves. 
<clears throat> and then um, during play, he, he began to have some certain nice ideas and uh, how to handle his dwarves and how dwarves logically explain to me how dwarves are usually because he had like a bit of background in role playing and I decided to make an emphasis on these dwarves and how because he was so happy telling me about what the dwarves were able to do so I actually um, actually encouraged him to explore the dwarfiness of his dwarves and he, he he began to get like he began uh, to to understand the input the input that was given and he began to get more attached to his dwarves. So when I killed him one, completely by accident, trust me, I'm not that evil. Uh, he was like, oh my god, he, he, you can actually see that he was he, he became more protective of, of his remaining two dwarves, and uh, and that's how he began to actually role play as the dwarves. You know, because he was more like the kind of guy that said, no, dwarves know this, usually in the third person. But then I began to make it more personal for him. And one of the dwarves, he, I managed to, to because he was so special for, to him, uh, he had been a survivor of several encounters in, in Sailors, uh, Sailors of the Starless Sea. And actually, when going down, he that guy had to die. That particular level zero dwarf had to die due to actual damage output. But seeing that this particular player was so completely, I decided to make something. And, uh, you know, I really tamper a lot. You know, usually in DCC, you had to let the dice be complete, the final arbiters or something. But sometimes I usually nudge this a bit only to enhance drama. That's me. Okay? That's me. So what I did was when, I, when that character had to die, uh, I told him to burn a lot of luck. Uh, there was also a halfling, which uh, at level zero I allowed them to burn luck. It, it, it really makes for some dramatic moments. And uh, he was able to survive with only one hit point, okay? But he was severely hobbled. And he almost lost his leg. And he had to use a crutch. And then the, and then this is this small act of me making this character, being completely unable to be in combat because he was completely out of combat. They only had one hit point, but he could barely move or even attack at all. But this player began to get so attached to this dwarf, to this crippled dwarf, and, and, and he loved it so much. And it was a completely random character. And I, I managed to make during one point to emphasize how particular and special this particular character was. And then he began to replay as that dwarf. See, I don't know if you are still understanding what I'm doing here, but um, if you want a player character to perhaps get more involved uh, with his uh, with his level zero guys, uh, you can make it like part of the whole adventure, and that's something that is going to be is completely organic because everything that happens within the game, you are going to pick up the cues, and then you are going to see which. Uh, that's this is something that comes with the experience, <clears throat> but it's it's a way that you can entice your players to role play. For example, all of this only to tell you that you you can entice your players to role play, but perhaps not in like this cartoony way. Okay, well, I'm this guy, I'm that guy, and no, no, no. You you can entice your players. It's, it has to be something that you have to do under the table, and you can do this by making your players uh, take notice of a completely random level zero guy that they have. And they begin to shine light on that level zero character. And then sometimes it doesn't, not, it doesn't work always, but sometimes the player is going to take, oh my God, he's going to see at this particular character with more fondness or with more interest. So when he, he, he or that character inevitably dies, because that's the fate of almost uh, all level zero characters, it's going to be like a real, uh, like a particular loss for him, it's going to be add a bit of drama. It's going to be like, oh, you know, oh, that, that feeling that when some, oh, why did he die? You know, it's like mm, a bit of frustration that keeps the players completely glued to the adventure. You ha you also have not to overdo it because if you kill all the players, uh, all of the all of his characters is going to be like, mm, you're going to be okay. You kill everything, okay? It, it's something that I do sometimes, not all the time, but especially on people that I see that begin to get attachment to certain things. And I usually do it with the very input that they give me. So to answer that question that Nacho told me, how players interact with their, with their level zero characters? Okay, in immediate ways. You can nonetheless try to 
surreptitiously and try to direct somebody to bring more of his nascent or innate or perhaps simple role-playing skills into the game if you want, okay? If you want, but it's not necessary. So we have players like this player I was telling you about, like Victor, that his whole, he, he only talks as himself with his nameless bunch of guys. And then the, there are other guys that play with his level zero commoners uh, in a certain way until you begin to subtly try to entice him to give them importance so that they can begin to role play a lot. But it's not necessary. You remember that it, 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 remember that being a judge is that you are also part of the game. And this is what I personally do to have fun, you know? It doesn't work with everybody. You actually have to pick some of the cues, especially if somebody is extremely fond of this or that, or, or, or he, they talk, oh my God, this is so interesting within the game. So, for example, I had one guy that he, he was not very interested in his level zero characters. He only wanted to explore, okay? So one of his guys that began to explore and survive some of the traps, you know, I began to like, oh my God, that's, that's a very lucky guy. He's, he's now the cave dweller, or he's now the, the cave explorer. And I began to give it nicknames. And then that level zero guy, which has completely had no personality, I began to give him tips about it. And then he was like one of his favorites. Uh, I had another guy that had like an urchin. You know, that, that concept, uh, uh, being an urchin is kind of common here in Latin America. Um, uh, so in, in a certain way, I, I, I was able to exploit that a bit more. You know, you have to be aware also of certain cultural tropes of your own country. But here, uh, when, when he had an urchin, I had, and I explained it to him, he, he began to like get more empathic with that guy and try to protect it, okay? Because, you know, it's Latin America is sometimes kind of common seeing uh, urchins here in the street. And, uh, well, he began to get more empathic with it. And I, I only nudged him a bit into it because I told him, you know, it's an urchin. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a guy that lives in the street and has no food. And then he began to visualize, oh, my God, yeah, you know. And there was one particular moment within the adventure when, this, when he climbed a wall when, with, with his urchin. And I said, you know what? That's that's what thieves do. You know, thieves in DCC are extreme. Oh my God, yes, yes. So he began to visualize that if perhaps that urchin lived at the end, he was going to make it a thief. So I began to to try to make certain certain encounters. I began to tweak them a bit so that his urchin could actually hide shadows. So what I'm saying saying here is that, that the way you're going, you or your players are going to act uh, or react or or, or 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 express themselves within the game. You know, it consists of about 80% their own personalities, the players' personalities, and a 20% a bit of nudging by the dungeon master. But remember, you do not have to force people into this. It's, you have to do it in a very subtle way. And that's, that's part of the magic for me as well, you know? It doesn't work all the time, you know? And I'm telling you this, oh my God, this guy is doing this or that, or, or you are going to be, oh my God, what a fool. But, that's how I do things, and sometimes it works, because I know people here in Latin America. Perhaps this won't work with people from the United States. I don't know. I, to be honest, I have never played with anyone from the States before in a table, okay? Um, you know, I, I actually want to play with some of you guys there in, in, in the United States, see how you guys play, and see some of my tricks here from in my Latin American tricks work there, okay? But, but that's for another session and another video. Okay, so I think I have answered Question number three, more than uh, extensively enough. And that's it. So, again, thank you for listening to me rambling here. I know that sometimes I repeat myself. Some of my videos, a lot of people say, oh my God, you, I, I really like what you say, but just, just, you usually repeat so much. Well, that's part of my personal quirk. And uh, thank you for being here with me listening. Um, if you like the video, please give it a like. Uh, and of course, if you have, if this is your first time in the channel, click subscribe. And also here on Instagram, you can see my Instagram link here. And if you have any question, any kind of question that I can help you with or, or, or ramble about with or philosophize about with, please do, please ask me. You know, I really enjoy people when they ask me, especially if you are completely new. You know, now no one learns just by, by reading or being on the internet. Sometimes you learn by asking people that are in, in this hobby, okay? 
So if you want to ask me anything, please do. I'm completely open. You can see that I, uh, I, I do this type of question and answers to, to, to my subscribers. I know my channel is small, so that, that makes it like more private, like a more special uh, uh, kind of place. So if you have any question for me, you have any kind of suggestion, please do. Please write to me. I love, uh, I love answering back to people. So again, thank you for being here with me on El Sotano del Brujo. And I hope you have an amazing day, an amazing night, no matter where you are. And game on, man. Bye. Take care.